Here's what you're going to do. You're going to act like a ratings agency and you're going to attach a rating to this company. I'm going to call it a synthetic rating to separate from an actual rating. I'm going to base my rating by looking at financial ratios. After all, that's what the ratings agencies use anyway to come up with the rating. In fact, I'm going to be simplistic and base your entire rating on one ratio. The ratio I'm going to use is the interest coverage ratio. It's your operating income divided by interest expenses. If you're a lender, you want this number to be a high number. The higher the number, the safer a borrower. So you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is. I'll back into a rating based on that interest coverage ratio. So you take Embraer, for instance. In 2004, the interest coverage ratio you come up with is 3.56 based on their operating income and their interest expense. Actually, I should draw your attention to how I came up with the 3.56 because it, it should reveal something about this process. I could have used the operating income from the most recent year, but that might give me a misleading view of the risk in the company. After all, when you lend to a company, you don't lend in the bad times or just in the good times, you lend across times. So I actually used an average operating income to try to capture some of that you know, stability or instability in earnings over time. So my job, with Embraer now is to convert that interest coverage ratio of 3.56 into a rating. And here's how I'm going to do it. I have a lookup table I've developed by looking at just rated companies. And here's what I do. I look up the rating for companies, I look up their interest coverage ratio, and then I try to do some reverse engineering. In other words, I try to figure out if I can estimate what the rating will be given your interest coverage ratio. I actually have two sets of tables, one for large market cap companies. These are companies with an interest with market cap greater than five billion and one for small market cap companies. Embraer in 2004, for instance, was, was a small market cap company, and that's the table I'm going to use to come up with its interest coverage ratio and rating. The interest coverage ratio of 3.56, given the lookup table then, would have yielded a rating of A- minus for Embraer. That is my synthetic rating for Embraer, and the default spread that goes with that rating is 1%. I'm almost home. Let's say I wanted to get a cost of debt for Embraer. I have a risk-free rate. Since I'm doing everything in U.S. dollars, that risk-free rate will be a U.S. dollar risk-free rate. I have the default spread for Embraer. Now, normally, I would just add those two and say that's the cost of debt for Embraer. But here's the one thing I'd be missing if I did that. Embraer is a Brazilian company. When investors buy bonds in Brazilian companies, they saddle with two types of default risk. One is the default risk of the company. The other is the default risk of the country in which the company is. It's not fair. If you're a company in a risky market, you carry two burdens on your shoulder. So here's what the cost of debt works out for Embraer. My risk-free rate is 4.25%. To that, I add two numbers. One is the 1% default spread for Embraer as a company, and the other is at least a portion of the country risk. Why only a portion? Embraer gets lots of its revenues in U.S. dollars. I think it's unfair to saddle Embraer with the entire country risk portion, which is 6%, I've added two-thirds of that 6% on based on looking at other companies which are like Embraer getting a lot of their revenues in dollars to come up with the cost of debt for Embraer. So risk-free rate in U.S. dollars because I'm doing everything in U.S. dollars plus a default spread for the country plus a default spread for the company gives me a cost of debt for Embraer as a company. So now that we have a cost of equity and a cost of debt for a company, we've got to bring them together in an overall cost of capital. And to make that estimate, we need weights for equity and weights for debt. Those weights, if you're doing valuation, should be market value weights, as opposed to what? As opposed to book value weights. Why market value weights? It's not because we assume that the market is right. That's not the right rationale. It's because that's what will cost you to buy the company today. So whether you like what the market price is or not, is or not when you go out and buy shares in this company, or you buy the equity in the company, you have to pay the market price. So the way to think about the market value weights is it's the cost of acquiring this entire business. So let me try this for Embraer, and this in a sense summarizes much of what we've been saying over these last few sessions. For the cost of equity, I start with the risk-free rate. I chose to do my cost of capital in U.S. dollar terms because my cash flows were in U.S. dollars, so my risk-free rates here are U.S. T-bond rates. The beta that I've used for Embraer is a bottom-up beta. It reflects the fact that it's in the aerospace business, and the initial equity risk premium I've used is a mature market premium. But to that, I've added a country risk premium and a lambda measuring Embraer's exposure to country risk. Those numbers come together to give me a cost of equity. To get the cost of debt, I used the approach I described earlier in this session to come up with a pre-tax cost of debt. Then I looked at the tax benefit Embraer gets from debt. 
Now remember how this tax benefit works. Interest saves you taxes at the margin. So to compute the tax benefit, you should be using a marginal tax rate. As opposed to what? As opposed to an effective tax rate. The marginal tax rate might not be in your financial statements. It comes from the tax code. That number for Brazil is 34%, the tax rate. That's what I use to get the after-tax cost of debt. The weights for debt and equity reflect their respective market values. For equity, it's simple. Share price times number of shares. For debt, I did a little tweaking. Embraer's debt was not publicly traded, but I took the book value of debt, took the interest expense, and since I knew what the average maturity of the debt was, I estimated a market value for the debt. Sounds mysterious, right? But it's pretty simple to do. If you can estimate the market price for a bond, you can estimate the market value for all debt. And here's what you're going to do. Where well, you have the, the face value of the bond, introduce the book value of your debt. Where well, you have the coupon rate, enter the interest expenses for your debt. Where well, you have the maturity of the bond, enter the weighted average maturity of your debt. Then use the market interest rate you computed, the pre-tax cost of debt, as your discount rate to discount those cash flows back. That's what I used as my market value of debt. It might sound like a lot of work for very little, but it'll save you some trouble down the road. The weighted average of my cost of equity and cost of debt is my overall cost of capital. Now, I've, I've assumed there are only two ways you can raise capital, debt or equity. You're saying, what if I have securities that don't fit easily into either bucket? Those are hybrids. There are a couple of very widely used examples of hybrids. One is convertible debt. Convertible debt is part debt, part equity. The debt portion, of course, is the bond. The equity portion is the conversion option. If you have convertible debt, my advice to you is separate it into conversion option and debt. Take the conversion option, throw it in with equity. Take the debt portion, throw it in with debt. Your problem goes away. Preferred stock is a little messier. It looks a lot like debt because it is a fixed dividend, but it does not give you a tax advantage. So you can't throw it in with debt, and you definitely can't throw it in with equity. It's one of the few cases where you might want to open a third element in your cost of capital. And the cost of preferred stock is just your preferred dividend yield. So at the end of the process, you're looking to come up with the cost of capital for your overall company. So let's summarize. When you have to estimate the cost of capital, you first have to estimate the cost of each element in the cost of capital, the cost of equity and the cost of debt, and if you have preferred stock, the cost of preferred stock. Then you have to attach weights to those numbers, and those weights should generally be market value numbers, market value of equity, market value of debt, and market value of preferred stock. Just make sure your weights add up to one. At the end of the process, you will have a composite cost of financing your firm, a cost of capital. That is what you will use as your discount rate if you're discounting cash flows the entire business. Of course, you might choose to discount cash flows to equity, in which case you can stick with the cost of equity. But having the elements in place will give you a much better estimate of value for this business.